Um, all right, so let's talk about some of the, the sort of the categories here of uh, that that you you break it down to. Um, one is uh, late capitalist body talk, and we sh- I should just tell people that the the contents, um, like the, the I guess the chapters of your book, I guess um, are it's really just a list of you know you have a list of I guess about thirty some odd words uh, that you. Um, uh, develop the, the the thesis around. So let's let's just talk about late capitalist uh, body talk. What's a good example of a uh, of body talk in that respect? Well, nimble is a good one. So nimble is a word that is used in um, mainstream journalism and in financial business journalism to describe corporations that have shed labor costs, basically, or other <laughs> operating costs. So a nimble corporation is one that um, can move very quickly and can leap and is spry and mobile, and it calls to mind, you know, the word. The, I think most people's association, at least English speakers' association with the word nimble, is you know the uh, nursery rhyme, Jack jumping, you know, Jack jump, jumping over the candlestick, and it's a word that Jack be nimble, a, Jack be quick, right? Okay, sorry. Exactly, yeah. Um, and so it's a word that used to, um, if you search it in you know, newspaper archives, it used to only appear in the sports section because it would describe like a nimble shortstop or something. And then it became a word used to describe corporations, which is now like mostly where you find it in, um, in, in journalism. And so it's a, again, like human capital, it's a way of, of talking about work without talking about workers, basically. And then uh, flexible is another um, is another one, and unlike nimble, flexible is used to describe workers. But again, it's used to describe increasingly onerous work schedules in which you have to be ready to appear at your job at the mall or at Starbucks or something at a different time every day. You know, you have a flexible schedule, but instead of describing that as extremely difficult and painful and um, disruptive to your daily life and to your family life and so forth. It uh, frames it as if it's like a like a um, positive, like a positive. Yes, a positive attribute. So, I mean, if you could say like, oh, yeah, no, I've got an inconsistent schedule as opposed to I'm on a flexible schedule that yeah, has right. very different uh, connotations as to who is bearing the burden of that uh, that schedule, right? I mean, it's just sort of uh, the idea is that yeah, no, I have uh, my schedule is flexible, but in fact, it's not the schedule that is a- that is actually flexible. It is the human who is being asked to be flexible. Yeah, and if you think about if you follow that metaphor a little bit further, then you're talking about people being bent and contorted in all kinds of different or painful directions. But, you know, we usually don't get that far when we're talking about a flexible worker or, or a flexible work schedule. And, 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 and to be clear, like this is language that just sort of sticks, right? Like people mm-hmm. find, I mean, I, people find that as they, you know, someone just threw this out in what, in, in one conversation, it seems like, or maybe somebody wrote a, um, uh, an HR, uh, you know, newsletter saying we're going to ask for more, you know, for a flexible schedule. And then everybody just found that a comfortable way to refer to what they were asking of their workers. Right. I mean, is that basically the way this stuff develops? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's hard to trace the uh, the way some of these terms develop. And I mean, I think that's what's sort of interesting about them. And that's what makes them um, keywords is that they are they kind of diagnose a collective or conventional wisdom or conventional stupidity as the case often is but it's a it's not something that um a, like a, an evil genius developed or invented at some particular moment it's uh, it's something that expresses you know the way that we talk about uh our lives under um you know late stage capitalism and so it's it's a good way i think of diagnosing some of the the ways of thinking that have become conventional. Um, let's talk about the the moral vocabulary uh, of late uh, capitalism. Um, mm-hmm. wh- what is wh- give us a couple examples of those? Well, uh, innovation is one. I mean, innovation has a has a kind of strange and long history 
uh, as a religious word. For the longest time, it was a term that was synonymous with a, with false prophecy. So to innovate was to um, was to improvise upon the word the word of God in a way that um, a, a, a human wasn't allowed to do. So if you're an innovator, you were a false prophet, or you were a conspirator, or a heretic, or something. And then it became um, kind of secularized in the 20th century, and became you know applied in the way we kind of recognize it now towards some particular task, uh, you know, a new uh, like a new way of manufacturing a thing or distributing a thing, but it still retains that air of prophecy. I think when we hear it used to describe, you know, great innovators or innovations in some particular firm, um, because it's so it's so rarely used to describe any actual recognizable object or thing. It's just a sort of a spirit that a successful person um, has within them. So it's kind of a moral quality. And passion is another one um, that connotes some kind of innate moral capacity that's supposed to serve you well at work, um, but often is you know, kind of like flexible, is a way of um, making your poorly compensated devotion seem like, a, um, seem like your life's work rather than something you should be paid for. So we always hear teachers described as passionate or... Um, you know, people who take care of the elderly at home are passionate about their work. Um, and we call, we, passion is sort of a substitute for um, a living wage. Right. <laughs> it's a, a passionate. <laughs> when we say they're passionate, we're saying they're underpaid and they don't seem to mind. Yeah. 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 They take home passion dividends instead of, um, instead of um, high wages. They would like a vacation, but instead we gave them the opportunity to do something that they seem to like. So that's basically <laughs> right. I mean, that seems what it like. That's that seems to be what uh, that that word means. An innovator is to me, seems to me to be also someone who's like a rebel, right? Which also yeah. implies yeah. that on some level that like they have a certain level of freedom that exists there, right? That they're not bound by um, by by sort of I guess. They're not encumbered by by what they're doing, as opposed to, I guess, I mean, I'm trying to think of like the, the they're rebels, as opposed to people who've just found a way to sort of like pay people less in some way. I don't know. I think of like like all the 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 gig economy stuff is sort of like it's a it's a it's a new innovation. We found how to get human beings to uh, function with just a lot less calories, or something like that. <laughs> Yes, or you know, like uh, you know, whatever people figured out how to do um, that caused the economy to crash in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Those that was some innovative work too. But because we also describe innovation only in ever only in positive terms, you know, it's only it's it's synonymous with improvement. Um, we that's another factor in its peculiar moral sense. But the point about rebellion is 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 a good one, and it's part of innovation's earlier history because it, you know, it was originally to to be an innovator was to be a rebel in, in a in a in a in a bad sense. But now it's the opposite, and creativity is another word that has that same that same kind of history. So you know, where once we might have thought of creative types as being unorthodox or. Um, you know, they sleep late. They don't like to go to work. Um, now, those kinds of attributes of idiosyncrasy or um, peculiarity or rebelliousness are kind of harvested by um, by by corporations and business schools as being like the stuff of real successful people. Right, and there's another uh, aspect of the type of words, uh, like sort of where the where um, the where there's um, there's a co-opting of uh, of sort of I don't want to say counterculture, but non-business cultures, right? Like, we, we, it, uh, like uh, we, give us an example of that dynamic. So, besides creativity, uh, the uh, the artisan is a good example. Um, you know, the artisan is somebody who pursues some kind of craft. Uh, passionately, to use another word, and is interested in doing so because of some devotion 
you know, not to the profit motive necessarily, but to, um, you know, like an intimate attachment to, to carpentry or to food or to some, or to some other kinds of, um, particular kind of object or business. And so the, um, originally, you know, the artisan was somebody who was sort of displaced by capitalist production. You know, the artisan who made a particular kind of chair was, put out of work and had to go work in the assembly line making um, making cheaper chairs. But the way that the word has gotten kind of absorbed into, you know, like high-end consumer culture now is a way of imbuing, um, you know, manufactured goods and uh, manufactured food products with some of this era of authenticity that is thought, you know, has long been thought to be lost in, in mass production. So that's another example of the, the artistry thing. Like, is, is that like, like craft beer and just sort of, I guess, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I, I, and to some extent I would say a lot of, I've, I mean, I noticed in the context of, of our advertisers on these programs, uh, that we, uh, we do here that there's that quality of like, we're going to let, um, people know, you know, the, we're going to put the founders sort of forward and, and make it just seem like it's, you know, it's two guys and maybe it starts with just two guys or two, two girls, but it, th- there's yeah. that whole quality of like, we're just regular people. Yeah. And it usually is, I think two guys in those cases. I mean, maker is a kind of a similar word to, um, artisan. Uh, but all these kind of words that describe some kind of tinkering, um, and, and, careful uh, devotion to a craft are all very gendered words. So, you know, a maker is someone who like knows how to do stuff with 3d printers and high tech, high technology kind of stuff. And that's usually, you know, um, that's like usually pictured as a male figure and it's valued now. And so does artisan, but crafting, you know, is kind of similar to those words, but it's never had this sort of prestige of, of making or artisanship because crafting is something women do, you know, and it's something that you do at home. It's not something that, um, is celebrated as, uh, in the, in the broader economy. Uh, you also have, um, a, a category of words that, um, uh, pushes the notion of, of new technologies. Um, mm-hmm. what words would those be? So data, smart, um, solution, solutions, um, innovation again. I mean, innovation is kind of, um, in all of the categories, it's kind of the, uh, the er word of the, of the book, but smart is, is a word that got its start, um, you know, in the military, uh, the smart bomb, I think is the way I first encountered the word used in a, as a, as a way of describing technology. Um, and the smart the smart bomb was originally called the um, a hobo in the Vietnam War, which was a sort of a portmanteau of homing bomb. And then oh. they kind of, they rebranded they rebranded it as a smart bomb, uh, which is probably a smart move on their part. And now it describes you know any kind of technology that is thought to have. Uh, on the one hand, thought to have an intelligence of its own, but really what that means is that it's thought to be kind of linked to our own intelligence or our own desires. And so, you know, the smart refrigerator, which knows when we need to buy more milk or the, the smart bed that knows just how puff, you know, fluffy you like your mattress to be.